you're leading another professional development initiative for your faculty later today and she was able to kind of squeeze us in so we've set this up so that you're going to be able to see her on the screen we're going to dim the lights uh you're, she will she can actually see all of you because of uh, we've got things kind of set up she can see the room um we'll be able to uh, have questions with the microphone here a little later on um and so without further ado if you could join me in welcoming dr michelle nancy brock Thank you so much, Jason. First, a big thank you to Jason for thinking of me and inviting me to um, speak with everyone today. I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, with the, the help of technology. Let's give technology a thumbs up for working for us today. And uh, I also wanted to say thank you to Stephanie and the rest of um, your great team for all of the amazing technical support and getting everything to work so smoothly this morning. It's been very impressive. So we're going to get started today with um, a little bit of an internal exercise. And I want to start by um, sharing with all of the introverts out there, don't worry, I'm not going to make you share what you're about to think inside your mind with anyone around you. So this is a safe exercise. But I'd like to invite you for a moment just to close your eyes. Even though that may feel a little weird right now, go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to reflect on your past life experiences and identify a time that you were trying something new and something different and you knew it was kind of an uncomfortable space for you and you really felt like you didn't belong. You felt like you didn't belong. And try to Reflect on that experience, imagine where you were, what you were doing, but most importantly, how it felt. And hold that with you over the next 30 minutes, okay? So go ahead and open your eyes. That feeling is a feeling that by, uh, connects all of us as humans. Um, there's a lot of different terms for it, um, but I think it's very important to recognize that everybody at some point in their life um, feels like they don't belong. And it's not a good feeling and it's hard to overcome, but when it is overcome, it's usually because you have the support of another person or other people to help you, to guide you, to encourage you, to motivate you. And that is something that our online students feel. That is something that our in-class, in-person students feel. Uh, and it's really important to be mindful of, particularly when we're teaching online. So we're gonna keep that in mind as we go over to some slides and jump into our conversation about humanizing online education. So when we teach online, it can be a lot harder to understand that we have students who feel this way, who feel like they don't belong, who feel like they can't do it. Those students um, can come from anywhere. They can have lots of different types of backgrounds, but we know that students who are first generation students um, or students who are, who are minorities, ethnic minorities, come from, you know, identify themselves as different in some way, feel like they really don't belong in an academic context. And I guarantee you that you have those students in your classes. And when we're teaching online, it can be a lot easier to just look at names on, on a screen and forget that those are actual people with these types of feelings trying, trying to achieve their college degree. And as was just noted in the opening remarks, not able to be on campus. It's a it is actually a privilege to be on campus. And what we know from research is that frequent and effective student to instructor interaction creates an online environment that encourages students to commit themselves to the course and perform at a stronger academic level. We often hear about the importance of substantive um, interaction or uh, instructor communication in online courses. Of course, that's it's critical. It's, 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 it's foundational to policy and regulation and, and but really what we wanna do here today is make that meaningful and understand that that relationship between you and your students is what's going to pick them up, what's going to motivate them, help them understand that they really can do this. And that's why you are so important. 
If we were to do an environmental scan today of all online classes across higher education, we would see them following, falling somewhere on a continuum. And at one end of the continuum, we see students over on the right that are saying things like, I had to teach myself. And we have students over on the left side of that continuum that say, my online instructor tried to help me. And it's the students over on the left end of the continuum that are in a class with a strong sense of community and they feel like they belong like they're part of, to belong, they feel like they belong to a group. At the other end, it feels more like going through a drive through um, You're hungry and you're gonna fill up that belly, but it's, it's all up to you to, to figure out how to make that happen. And uh, there's really not many folks there to, to support you through your journey. So the lens that we use to think about online, our online courses is really important. And uh, I understand as an online instructor myself, it's very, it's very common, it's very easy to focus on our content and really get stuck there. And while I'm not trying to imply that our content isn't important and our course design isn't important, all that stuff is critical, but our teaching is also very important. Our presence in a course is really, really critical. So let's start there and think about what it feels like for a student in a class that is not humanized. I can see that a professor isn't trying to interact with the course and I, it's just little things like the automatic announcements that only show up at 12 a.m. on a Sunday. Like you know it's all uh, automated, they're just not, or you leave a question and ask <coughs> the professor and three weeks later you get a response. Like that's when I start to judge like I just wish you wouldn't be here. Like I wish you would focus your energy somewhere else because I'm not learning anything, but yeah. So that's the only judgment is when you're not doing anything. We don't care when you make mistakes though. So hold that experience in your mind. Um, and this is not to say that automated announcements are bad. They are a great way to save time. But the problem is that that is not an effective way to cultivate your presence, right? And to remind students that you're there for them and that you care about them. So one of the things that we're doing in the California Community College system, um, we've recently developed and rolled out a, a new online course. It's a four week online course for faculty to take called Humanizing Online Teaching and Learning. Um, this is kind of a, a next generation evolution of a similar faculty development course that I taught at a, um, in my last role at CSU Channel Islands. So I just wanna acknowledge that uh, things kind of started there. And, I'm going to take you through some of the things that faculty are engaged with in this course and show you some of the examples. Uh, one of the things that we find is really foundational um, to engage faculty in this conversation of humanizing, whoops, I'm going backwards now, hold on, I I'm pushing the wrong button, is to think about the way that we um, position or establish relationships with our students. And, um, you know, the second you look at this, you're probably thinking about the way that your classrooms are set up, right? This is the traditional relationship. It's not just a, a, a way of, of communicating. It's, there's a hierarchy here that um, really underpins the way that we, we teach in higher education. And one of the problems with this is, is that when we look at uh, cultures, non-white cultures, this is not the kind of um, relationship that underpins education. So we, in, with our faculty development offer, um, opportunities, we're really trying to underpin concepts from culturally responsive teaching. Uh, and there's a concept called learning partnerships that comes from the work of Zaretta Hammond, who is the author of a great book titled Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. It's not about online teaching, but these concepts are directly applicable. And the, the concept is that um, if we can identify and kind of relate to our students as partners in the learning process, then we're going to be starting off in our course with a much flatter foundation, developing mutual uh, relationships based on mutual respect, which is a much more culturally responsive way to go about teaching. Uh, essentially, our students who have that sense of um, doubt, that self that self-doubt that, we, that, we that we're still remembering from our opening exercise, they're going to be more willing to come to you and to view you as someone who's going to guide them and help them through their learning experience. And they're gonna work harder because of that. 
So we have a great infographic about humanizing. Um, the three concepts built into facilitation are presence, empathy, and awareness. And another really important part of this concept of humanizing is to just recognize and remember that learning is just not all about cognition. In higher education, we have a real way of privileging cognition, but we've got to remember that learning is really social and emotional also. So we want to think about that effective domain of learning as well as the cognitive domain. And within that um, facilitation process, um, there are essentially two basic ingredients that tie back to the research. Uh, the first element is instructor presence and the second element is social presence. Now, social presence has a long history in research about online teaching and learning. Uh, it has been tied to increased student satisfaction, increased student interaction, and increased depth of learning. And what social presence is essentially is it is that transformation of words on a screen into people. It's when you really start to sense that you're, you're in an environment learning with real people. And so that whole social part of learning is very important to bring into the course, into the um, online classroom to develop that social presence. So we spend a lot of time unpacking this in the course, but it's not just about learning about the research, it's about viewing examples and about participating themselves. So I'm gonna show you some examples now. Um, and again, kind of hold in the back of your mind that feeling that you started with when we did our exercise, that self-doubt, that, you know, am I good enough, can I do this? And also remember that student um, comment that we just listened to a moment ago who felt so dis distanced and felt like his student or his instructor really wasn't there and engaged in the course. And imagine if Denise was your online instructor. Hi students in English 49, excuse my voice, I'm a little sick. I just pulled up onto campus on Saturday. I'm in the car, not driving. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you who learned something new this week. I'm just going through your voice thread comments and I'm super impressed. I know it's new for just about everyone. Most of you mentioned recording your voice and even the brave ones that recorded video that they were really nervous. Um, but I think that you saw that it's a really great way for us to interact and and feel like a real class and talk about the things that we read and are working on in this class. So you'll see me start commenting back to you. And I just wanted to say great work on week two. I really appreciate all your effort. And I will be opening the folder for week three um, by tomorrow morning. So pretty cool, don't you think? Wouldn't you have a smile on your face if you saw that? Uh, Denise Madilly Williams teaches English as a second language and also English at Miramar College. She teaches online and face to face. And for her online courses, she uses a, a mobile app called Clips, C L I P S. Unfortunately, it's only available for iOS or Apple devices because it's actually an Apple product. But she records those uh, using her phone from anywhere, and she does it while she's walking across campus, um, walking around the track, walking her dog in her car, as you can see, and it actually burns in captions automatically as she speaks. Um, she, the only editing she does in these videos is actually to the captioning. She toggles over to those captions and edits them real quick. And then she shares them out to her professor account on Instagram and Twitter, and she also embeds them in her LMS. So just a real, you know, low stake way to use video in a class. This is one of the examples that we like to share with the faculty to get them to understand that video doesn't have to be a high end production and you don't have to be perfect when you use it. Um, that's really hard for faculty to get over. Another thing that we are playing with is this idea of a humanized uh, syllabus. And I just want to show this to you. This is a digital syllabus. Um, I've also referred to this as a liquid syllabus. And it has um, videos right inside of it. Hi there. I'm Michelle Bikansky Brock and I'll be your instructor for the history of still photography. This is a tintype from about 1860. Why 
Why is it that even though these images were not fragile, people still carried them around in cases? So really trying to encourage faculty to rethink what a syllabus can be. Um, a lot of times, you know, we kind of get stuck in our ways and we don't think about it as something that we can innovate. But if we can start actually just including little quick videos in that syllabus to engage and motivate students and to help them understand that, you know, you are a person who has a personality, who really enjoys doing what you do, um, it can be a great way to break down some of that anxiety as well. So really embracing the power of the human voice is central to um, humanizing. And it doesn't have to be you on video. That's another thing that, as I just mentioned a minute ago, we're finding that faculty really are reluctant to show themselves on video, some more than others, and that's a barrier. So one of the things that we're doing is engaging them with a tool called Adobe Spark Video, which is a really cool free tool. Just go ahead and look it up. Um, it, it, you, can, you can use this tool online and you can also download the Adobe Spark Video app if you have an um, iOS device. And um, Adobe Spark doesn't show you, it shows images. So I'm going to show this great clip from Heather Castillo at CSU Channel Islands, who uses this video to introduce a research paper. Oops, I lied. I'm not going to show that one. Um, my apologies, hold on one second here. I think I can still show it. I think I have that link. I thought it was embedded there, but I guess it wasn't. The world has always danced. In celebration, as part of a ritual to educate and share, what does dance reveal about us? Why do people dance the way they do? For this research project, pick an area in the world, then discover their dance. So you can start to imagine how introducing a research project, which can be, you know, really stressful for students as something kind of inspirational can start to change the dynamic a little bit in a course too. Um, I believe this one's embedded. This is a, another Adobe Spark video that um, Matt Mooney at, the, at Santa Barbara Community College uses to introduce one of his online modules. He thinks about before a new module starts, he really takes time to be mindful of what the sticky concepts are going to be in that module and then uses Adobe Spark to kind of tease those out. Ugh, I lied again. My goodness. Let me play that one for you too. Hello everyone, I want to take just a moment here to try and clarify what we mean when we talk about the triangular trade. Now this was a colonial era trade network that tied together the mainland colonies, specifically New England, to Africa and the West Indies. And to try and make sense of this, maybe we should start in the West Indies. These are the West Indies, today we call them the Caribbean. This is the islands in the Caribbean Sea south of Florida. And the reason the West Indies were so important during the colonial era was because they produced sugar. Specifically, enslaved Africans were forced to grow sugar, and sugar was incredibly valuable. Um, and the West Indian sugar planters, the slave masters, whether they were French, English, Dutch, or Spanish, grew incredibly wealthy. We should also note that one of the byproducts of sugar production is something called molasses. So what you need to know here is that both sugar and increasing amounts of molasses were shipped from the West Indies up to the mainland American colonies, specifically the New England colonies. Now you might be wondering, molasses? Why are we talking about molasses? What's the big deal? My grandma uses molasses to bake cookies, whoopee. Well, it is a big deal because the New Englanders did not use molasses to bake cookies. They used it to make rum, um, a powerful alcoholic beverage that you may have heard of. Okay. 
So you get the point there, but you can see how engaging he is and how this video, which is less than three minutes long, um, introduces students to these concepts that they're going to be reading about, which is also an effective strategy for just supporting uh, learning in general. That's an example of universal design for learning. We know that learning out loud uh, well, this is a quote from a student that I have discovered through some of my, my own studies about, um, about using voice in online classes. Learning out loud helps us get to know each other. It makes us more sensitive to one another's opinions and thoughts, and we're more likely to be respectful to one another. That's a quote from one of my past online students. So we get, we get uh, faculty themselves also engaged with asynchronous video conversations, and this is one um, this is an example of what Flipgrid looks like, but they participate in themselves. So it's about immerse, immersing, immersing faculty in this online experience that is both uses voice, it uses video, and it's also facilitated by me. I'm there, I, or another great facilitator. We have lots of other great facilitators, um, you know, who, who are really demonstrating these principles. And I was going to just show one more example. This is from Janet Mitchell Lambert. She's an English fa faculty member who's using Flipgrid in some really interesting ways. And Flipgrid, again, is a free mobile app. And, and what's great about it is that students don't actually have to have an account to use it. And it does have auto captioning built in, which is not perfect right now, but it's, it's really improving quickly. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm really keeping my eye on Flipgrid. And it's, it's kind of interesting to imagine yourself, you know, kind of seeing a prompt written on a screen like the one here that you can read at the top of, of the slide here. And then try to imagine how it feels instead if you actually see an instructor. Um, like hey there. This. So for this week's Flipgrid, what I would like you to do is find one of the poems that touched you this week and find a place in your house or outside that reminds you of the poem share the place in the video and then go ahead and share why as well as a couple of lines from the poems. It would be lovely if you take a look at some of your peers posts and then respond to them as well. Thank you. And I've got a student response here to share with you. So a poem that reminded me of a place was Cherry Log Road by James Dickey and not because the poem is about two lovers who are meeting in a junkyard, but because of what is in the junkyard. And in the junkyard are old cars that um, the speaker um, jumps to and from each car, and he relives the histories within each car. And um, here are a few lines here. Um, in the parking lot of the dead, time after time, I climbed in and out of the other side like an envoy or movie star, met at the station by crickets, a radiator cap raised its head, become a real toad or a king snake as I neared the hub of the yard, passing through many states, many lives. So she goes on and continues reflecting and making some great connections to the car in which she's sitting, her own car. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot to take away from, from this example here from, from from Janet, and I think one of them, one of the many things, um, is the the impact of mobile video. So when mobile, when video, when when we can ha encourage our students to be using their smartphones um, as an option to record video, they can go places and they can pull different in you know experiences and parts of their environment into those videos, which is a really powerful way of making connections between your curriculum and their real world. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I want to stress that Janet teaches English, and so she's using this exercise here to really kind of uh, scaffold the writing process by getting, not, but instead of having everything be being, uh, you know, done in writing, they're, they're talking, they're literally talking and kind of trying to make these more meaningful, very meaningful connections to what they're reading about before they go into the more um, summative assessments about um, about their content. So great way, great example of, of, of a teaching practice there. And before I wrap up, I just wanted to share a few comments or quotes from faculty that have gone through the course. Uh, this is from Meg Phelps. 
my presence matters so much more than I thought. I was guilty of trying to be a neutral voice with a professional or sterile presentation of content. I see now that being active, responsive, present, and empathetic is also vital to the course and to my students. And then another quote, being introduced to Flipgrid and Adobe Spark was like finding the closet to Narnia. I absolutely loved reading that quote. And it's a really important reminder of encouraging faculty to try new things and to be experimental and um, you know, look at what's happening outside of our learning management system. There's a lot of amazing tools that are easy and free that can be integrated. Um, into teaching and learning with some you know effective practices to keep in mind to support students another quote do my students see me as a person do they know that i see them as individuals and that i empathize and it's this increased reflection about teaching practices that's so powerful to see faculty embrace as they're coming out of the the professional development experience and this Faculty shares, now I can author my own videos and communicate with students beyond just the tools provided by Canvas. I'm so excited to finally know how to use YouTube. The sense of empowerment that we're seeing faculty express after they record a video on their smartphone and share it to their own YouTube account and edit the auto captions and then embed it in their learning management system. Wow, they get so excited when they look back and think, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. They're starting to share these, these successes with, with their kids, they say, and feel really proud of it, which is neat to see. So that's a little bit about what's happening in California. Again, the name of my team is um, at one and O-N-E stands for Online Network of Educators.org. We're funded by the California Community College um, Chancellor's Office to provide professional development to our whole system, which includes 114 colleges, more than 60,000 faculty, and more than 2 million students. Um, so that's what, that's what I do every day. That's the fun stuff that, that I engage with. And we have a few minutes left for some questions, and I would um, love to, to take some if you have any. So thank you so much, Michelle. This microphone's not going to amplify me, but I'm not going to talk for very long. Uh, for Michelle to hear your question, I will come to you with a microphone. Who has something they'd like to ask? All right, I saw a hand back here first. Great. In the meantime, thank you so much, Michelle. I think that was quite engrossing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question about that. The syllabus that you showed with the embedded videos, it looked like a dynamic syllabus. What kind of platform was that on? Was that in a learning management system like Blackboard? Actually, no. That's a, um, a, that was created with a tool called Popular, and it's P-O-P-U-L-R dot me dot M-E. P-O-P-U-L-R dot me. Um, so, yeah, I can, I can talk through that a little bit. It's a public website. So basically it's a public web page. And what popular is, is it's one of these micro publishing tools that allows you to create a single web page. Um, one of the challenges with popular and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm not promoting it as wholeheartedly and as much as I did a couple of years back is that it does have some accessibility gaps. It's not as accessible as some of the other tools out there. Um, and it just so happens that that's, that's the, the tool that my syllabus from that course that I taught in the past is still in. But one that I would encourage you to experiment with is the new Google Sites. If, you, um, if you're okay with using Google, there's a new version of Google Sites that came out a couple of years ago, and um, it has accessibility built into it. So when you're uploading your images, the, you can add the alt tags, and it has headings and all those sorts of good things. And that also is a public web, web page. Another option is Adobe Spark Page. Within Adobe Spark, there's actually three different tools. There's video, post, and something called page. And the page creates beautiful web pages, but there are also some accessibility gaps there as well, um, which makes it a little, you know, not great for using for something like a syllabus unless you were going to have two options for students to actually access. So hopefully that that answers your question. Great question. And we'll, we'll Michelle, if you can. Let you hear the question. If you could repeat it, so then everyone could hear it um, and answer. Would that be, be okay? All right. So thank you for the. Okay, we got some questions. About All right. Sorry. Michelle, just to add to what Michelle mentioned, with creating a, a, a syllabus like that. Jason, she can't hear you. 
Oh, I can I can hear him. Okay. That's okay. Um, because by creating that, it's something that you can share with prospective students. How many of you maybe email some students saying, "Tell me about this course. I'm signing up for it for free." Next question. Go ahead. So my question is actually kind of for you all, for Stephanie, because um, I was thinking about the portfolios that are offered through Blackboard, and I know there's options where, as instructors, we can create them, and if that would be a viable platform for something like the digital syllabus. So the question was, for everybody in the room, was about using the portfolio tool as kind of a digital syllabus. It, it is a really interesting option. Uh, because you can create a portfolio and then you can share that with everyone. Uh, the Blackboard Portfolio tool kind of creates a mini website. So it would be one, one other platform, particularly for those who are familiar with the portfolio or if you're thinking about experimenting with it. Um, it's not probably as modern and fresh as some of the tools that Michelle has recommended, but it, it would be a possibility to experiment with. All right, I see one here. Hi, one of my worries is um, integrating a technology as has happened with a lot of the Google products and then suddenly next year it disappears. So I did a lot of things with Google Earth and Flickr and then it disappeared. And, um, and so is there, is there a, somebody who is kind of inventorying like here are your best bets, your safest bets if I'm going to make an investment? These are technologies, they've been around for a while, they're not likely to suddenly disappear. Um, I realize like no one can predict the future, but you know, are there some best bets? Is there a website of a person who's kind of, you know, keeping tabs on that kind of thing? <sighs> yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of laughing at the irony of the book that I wrote about emerging technologies and the minute it goes to print, it's already outdated, right? So I totally get that. Um, and I do think that the more you do embrace different tools, you are opening yourself up to that. So that's just something that you have to acknowledge. And I think that each person in this room kind of feels differently. And some people are like, that's really important to me because I like to have different things coming. I like to try different stuff and others, maybe not so much. But one, a, a couple of the things that I keep in mind, so I don't, I can't really point you to a resource that keeps that kind of vetted. I mean, I, I tried keeping these things in mind when I wrote the last edition of my book. And like I said, some of them went away. So some of the tools have gone away. So there is no way to predict really. But, um, you know, I look, when I see something come out from Adobe, I feel pretty confident that it's going to be around a while because Adobe is a, is a company that is very, very well known. It also has, has a lot of traction in education itself. Um, so that's something I look for. Uh, and then also to look at whether or not the company that is providing the tool has a good revenue model. So again, Adobe, that's a slam dunk for Adobe. Um, but when you see another tool come out, um, for example, like Popular, it's still around, but Popular actually was acquired by another tool a couple of years ago. And I've had conversations with their, their CEO saying, okay, so is it going to be around? Is it going to go away? And they're assuring me that it's going to stay. But you know, I, I, I don't know. So it, it's hard to predict those things. And, and something that gets a little, makes me a little leery is when I'm looking at a tool that looks really, really awesome, but they have no way to make money. And that's not a good business model. And every educational technology tool is part of a business. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind as you're kind of looking and embedding new tools. Um, so I, I wish I had a magic answer for you, but it is just kind of part of the it's part of the game. If I can piggyback on that, that's partly why institutionally we do provide a learning management system as kind of the, the baseline that we support, we know is not going away, and then these other tools that you can augment with and you can make use of, right? You can kind of pull those in and, and swap them out as needed, but you have at least a platform that you know doesn't just go away. And we've all seen plenty of changes with learning management systems, right? So it's not like those don't change too. <laughs> all right. Excellent. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a uh, very, very uh, yeah, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question is uh, revolved around the versatility of um, technology that you introduce for faculty to be able to humanize their syllabus and online teaching. And I really like that idea. Uh, my experience, however, is that I'm still grappling with you know, how to be versatile with technology. And the reason for that had been 
what I learned early on was that, okay, well, if I use, if I record my uh, lecture, I should try to provide caption, right? And that I tried, as much as I tried to do it, I found that it is taking huge chunk of my time. And I would love to do what you are doing. But my question is, how do we kind of balance this question of providing, you know, caption for students who may not be able to comprehend or who need, I mean, to follow everything that is being, uh, you know, provided uh, through online uh, platform. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I imagine that, that maybe Jason or Stephanie might have some, something to respond to about that. But the question itself was about captioning and how when we start recording videos, the need to make them accessible through captioning can really add a lot of, um, of um, make, require a lot of extra time on behalf of faculty. Uh, one of the things that we really encourage faculty to do is to not record long lectures. Just don't make them long really start chunking them up into short videos. And if you think, oh, but I have much more to say, then create another video. And really start with that kind of instructional design approach to what, what are the objectives and maybe have one video for each objective, um, but start chunking them up. And um, you know, if you're comfortable using YouTube, it's phenomenal how good the auto captions have gotten. And so now you let the auto captions process you go in and you edit those auto captions and it, it, it I, I mean, I can do a 10 minute video in just a matter of minutes. You just actually have to go in, read the auto captions. You've got to add um, um, capitalization in your periods and correct the spelling and, it, and it's done. And it's, it's really pretty good. Uh, so those are some of the tips that we provide. Um, but we, we, yeah, we have some other automated services provided for captioning across the system as well. And another piece with that, um, if you're the kind of person who likes to script what you're going to say, you don't want to just off the cuff talk to your students, you draft the script, and then you, you record that, and you do the same thing. You can take that chunk of text and you can just plop it in, and YouTube will actually time it all up, the, the, the captioning piece, for you all the time. Like Michelle said it's phenomenal. It's getting better and better as people keep using it. Another plug this afternoon, uh, I believe it's this afternoon, one of our breakouts is about accessibility. I want to talk about universal design. My panelists are going to talk a little more about kind of the captioning piece of the video. So if you want to learn more and dig into this a little more, that would be a great uh, breakout session for you. So, Michelle, maybe one more question. Is that okay? Are you? Yeah, I'm great. Okay. Maybe, maybe one more question. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, can we give Michelle one more round of applause? <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. We're recording this, correct? So, will you be able to come back? There'll be a recording to it? Yeah, I can get you that. And um, so, so, thank you uh, again, Michelle, for being here. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. So, an example.